Welcome back everyone to the channel. Tonight's terrifying tale is about a grandfather's confession. On his dying bed telling his grandson, the main character of this story, what happened to him in his youth and what he expects to see when he dies. Do you believe in the afterlife? The further? Purgatory? Heaven and hell? Well, stay tuned. It's about to get spooky. If you're new to the channel, subscribe, click on that bell, and smash that thumbs up and tell a friend. My grandfather lay dying in our house, being eaten alive from the inside by cancer. His face was sunken, his trembling, arthritic hands looking like claws as he reached out for my shirt and pulled me down closer to his mouth. I stared into his intelligent brown eyes, but they looked like they were already dead like doll's eyes. They barely moved, just staring straight up at me, all hope and life being stripped away from him in his final days. Xavier. He said to me slowly, chewing the word. I am so glad you are here with me. I don't want to be alone. I shook my head, trying to keep tears from streaming down my face. I blinked quickly, clearing them away. I will never leave you alone like this, I said, grabbing his hand. It felt cold and brittle, the bones feeling like those of a bird underneath his thin, papery skin. You're my grandpa. I love you. We all love you. He nodded. There's a lot you don't know about our family, he said. A lot I need to tell you before I go. I always wanted to put it off before, thinking to myself that there would be another day, another better time to tell you. But I know now that it isn't true. There will never be a better time to tell you, and I may not have another day. He turned away from me, coughing violently. Spasms rocked his thin body as he gasped for air. Pulling out a handkerchief he always carried around, he wiped his lips. The white cloth came away with bright red trails. He was coughing up blood almost constantly now. As he gulped in another breath, I went to the nightstand next to his bed and pulled out a pill of morphine and another of ibuprofen to give him. He waved me away. Just the ibuprofen is fine, he said. I need to keep a clear head for what's coming. But what's coming, Grandpa? I asked, pouring an ice-cold pitcher of lemon water into a glass and dropping the pill into his hand. He took it, sipping at the water slowly, then appeared to feel better. The ferryman, he said, and he is going to want payment. This is the story my grandfather told me when I was a little boy. He used to sit by my bed at night before I went to sleep, sometimes reading Dr. Seuss or Roll Dahl to me, but other times he would tell me stories. He was originally a massive man, well over six feet tall with bulging muscles from working in construction his whole life. His eyes were always bright, curious and compassionate. But in the end, the cancer and arthritis took all of that away from him. Many years ago, he began sitting in a chair next to my bed, no longer reading but looking up at the ceiling, his brown eyes twinkling as he recited the story by heart. There was a boy. He liked to play outside a lot. He would spend all day in the forests near his house, and every night, he would come back dirty, scraped up, smelling like pine sap and sweat, but he loved it. He tried to explore deeper and deeper. His father had died mysteriously, so he only had his mother. The mother was a nice woman, but she always worried about her son. Don't go in the sun, she would tell him, because sunlight causes cancer. Don't be around cigarette smoke she said, because even just being around it will kill you. Don't eat red meat, she once said, 
because that will kill you too. But the boy would just smile, nod, and think about his time in the forest. He knew his mother only worried because she loved him, you see. On a Sunday after church, he changed his clothes and ran out farther in the woods than he had ever gone. He ended up losing the main trail along the way, following what looked like a deer trail for miles. Yet someone had clearly been there before him. An eye surrounded by a clawed hand was carved into a tree every few hundred feet. The marks looked fresh. Ahead of him loomed a cave. It had a monstrous black mouth. Torches blazed along both sides of the walls further in. He had a bad feeling, but he was just a little boy, you understand. He went inside. The cave floor descended rapidly. The torches kept throwing off their eerie shadows all around him. A smell like sulfur extended from further up ahead, and occasionally, he heard eerie screaming that echoed back from him from far away. But he wanted, needed, to know what this place was, so he kept going forwards. After about a half an hour of walking, he found himself at a subterranean river. There was a little ferryman's boat on it, abandoned for now, at least. It had a long stick and two oars. It didn't look like any boat he had ever seen. It looked like those he had seen in the history textbooks from ancient Egypt, carved almost like a banana, with strange hieroglyphics of eyes and half-human, half-animal beings painted on all sides. Laughing with glee, he jumped in. But as he did, he realized that someone had written on all the cave walls next to the boat. Many languages existed here. Looking around, he saw writing in English nearby. Huge, spiky letters that covered the wall from 15 feet up to the ground floor. And being intrigued, he read it. Those who wish to cross must now pay their respect. First, suffer a loss, in coinage or in death. If you do not heed the warning here and written, then surely all your greed will cause you to first sicken. Next will come the dreams of horrors that are blind, the cracking of the beams holding up your mind. Last will come your death. We will take your body back. When you finish every breath, Nynx makes your eyes turn black. Now this little boy didn't know what a Nynx was, or who had written the poems in dozens of languages, or whose boat it was. But he was intensely curious to see what was on the other side of the shore. So, he pushed himself off with the stick, using the oars to cross the river. The screaming and echoes had all stopped, at least for now, and all he heard was soft splashing of the oars as he paddled across the river. As he got to the other side and dismounted, he realized he had made a terrible mistake. There were bodies everywhere. Bodies of men, women, and children, Bodies of animals, bodies of half-human, half-animal creatures that didn't exist in our world. And all of them were mummified, wrapped up in pure white gauze, only their heads visible. Their eyes were all closed, looking peaceful and happy. When he stepped foot outside the boat onto the shore, however, the eyes of all of them flashed open in an instant. The creaking of their old joints were the only thing he could hear when they turned their heads to look at him, hissing and screaming in unison. From farther on in the cave, he heard the running of feet. A man with pale, cracked flesh falling off all of his body shrieked like someone being burnt alive, his mouth falling open and showing countless broken teeth. Boy! The figure cried in a deep, terrible voice. Boy, give me the payment! Where's your payment? Coins or death, boy! Coins or death! I am the ferryman, and I need your payment! Scared witless, the boy jumped back into the boat and immediately began paddling back to the other shore as fast as he could. But as he drew near, the thing had grabbed the rope and began pulling the boat back. In a panic, the boy leaped out of the boat and began to swim the last ten feet. 
he felt cold, dead hands trying to grab him from the bottom of the river. They dragged him under. Water filled his lungs as he began to drown. Kicking with all of his strength in blind panic, he managed to get them to release him and finally got away, losing both of his shoes in the process. The screaming of all the mummified, tortured beings followed him as he ran, soaking wet and terrified back to the entrance. Son, I was that boy, and I have paid for it many times since then. I should have never gone down in that cave. This story always terrified me. After my grandpa kissed me goodnight, I was hiding under the covers, shaking in fear, thinking about the horrible story he had told me and hoping it was just that, a story. My grandfather tried the turn in his deathbed, his weak frame barely holding him up as he shifted his weight. He looked up at me, tears in his eyes. I'm sorry, Xavier, he said. You know the story, and while you may not believe it, it is true. I thought it was just some nightmarish hallucination, maybe a one-time epileptic fit or something, and I convinced myself of that for years. And then my mother, your grandmother, died, and the poem came true. She was in hospice care at our home, just like I am now, and when she took her last breath, her eyes closed in peace. I exhaled a sign of relief. I had constant nightmares about that creature, the owner of the boat, the ferryman, coming back in a rage. I had dreams about bodies raising from the dead, their eyes black and full of hatred. All I could hear was my heart beating in my chest and my rapid breathing as I watched my mother's corpse. And then, after a minute, her eyes flew back open, totally black now. Her joints creaked as she moved her head to look straight at me. With a guttural cry, she wrapped her hands around my neck and tried to choke me to death. I ended up grabbing a syringe from the table next to her body and stabbing her. Well, I guess it was really now an it in the eye. She finally released me, and I fell back, choking and gasping. But she rose from the bed, now able to walk again, an old withered puppet being controlled by something beyond my comprehension. Something evil, something that wanted payment for what I had accidentally done as a little child. And she chased me, Xavier. She chased me upstairs. I locked myself in my room, grabbing my little twenty-two that I used for plinking and target practice. I ended up having to shoot my own mother's body in the head five times before she fell back down unmoving. Her eyes were still pure black, however, and they would stay that way, even as we buried her. I talked to some historians who knew ancient history, and while they clearly didn't believe my story, they told me that cultures along put coins on the eyes of their dead to pay the ferryman. I tried it. Every time my cousin or uncle or aunt died, I made sure to put two pure silver coins on their closed eyes, as soon as they took their last breath of life. And it worked. The ferryman never came back to me. You need to do this too. When I die, put the coins over my eyes, or he will take control of my body, like he did so many before me. I scuffed at this, but I could see he was in a lot of pain and fear. I nodded. Sure, Grandpa. I can make sure to put coins on your eyes. But I knew it was just some delirious conviction of a dying man. Of course I wasn't going to put coins over his eyes. My grandfather died an hour later. And that was when everything went wrong. After my grandfather took his last breath... I covered him up in a white sheet and left the room to call the hospice nurse. Part of me felt relief that his suffering and pain was over, though I also felt a great deal of sadness. I was always close with my grandfather. Hello? The nurse said, answering the phone immediately. It happened, I said. Samuel has passed away, she sighed. I'll be right over. 
she said, hanging up immediately. The news hadn't been unexpected. They had said he might survive a few more weeks, but he might die at any moment. I was grateful that he didn't have to linger for any more days in that horrid state. Taking morphine every couple of hours just to make the pain bearable, drooling, trembling, his eyes looking like tiny pits of water at the bottom of a deep well. I asked him if he wanted me to get him a higher dose of opiates, if he wanted to hasten the end. He had looked at me seriously. We cannot commit suicide, he said. What is a few more weeks of agony compared to the potential for the ruination of my soul? What if the suicide condemns us to hell forever, or even just for a while? You must be strong in life, son, and you must try to be strong in death. Try to find peace even when everything hurts and your body is failing. I nodded. He was a religious man, and suicide was a taboo subject. But I had to ask, he was clearly suffering with every breath and every additional moment of consciousness. I wouldn't have let my pets suffer that way, so why let a human being? But he was from a different generation and he took the teachings of the Bible seriously. As I waited for the nurse to arrive, sipping a cup of coffee in the kitchen, I heard something rustling from the living room where my grandfather's corpse lay. Hello? I said. Is someone there? No one responded, but I heard a slow shuffling, like someone dragging their feet slowly across the wooden floor. I got up to investigate. My grandfather stood in the threshold of the doorway, the white sheet strewn haphazardly on the floor behind him. His eyes had turned pure black. A stream of blood trickled down his face from the side of his mouth, drops of it splashing onto the floor. Like a trail of breadcrumbs, the blood led from the current position of his catatonic body to the bed where he had died. Holy shit, I said jumping up. You okay? He stared at me blankly, and he started shivering violently, his teeth chattering as he stared blankly through me. I approached him slowly, a sense of dread coming up over me as I got within a few feet of him. I waved my hand in front of his black eyes, but he didn't move. Grandpa? In a blur, his hand shot out, grabbing me by the throat and lifting me off the floor. He had an iron grip his strength far above and beyond what a frail, cancer-ridden body should have been able to muster. I tried to speak, but he was cutting off my air. Stop! I managed to squeak out through the suffocating grip he maintained on my throat. I felt in my pockets as my vision started to turn black, grasping for my keys. With the last of my ebbing strength, I shoved my house key into his eye, twisting it. His grip immediately slacked, and I fell hard on the floor, gasping and retching, my throat burning and spasming. I coughed, taking in sweet lungfuls of air. My vision started to come back to normal. I looked up, seeing my grandfather staring down at me with a look of hatred and fury that I had never seen on his face before. One eye dribbled vitreous fluid and gore from the eye down his cheek, mixing with the dark blood that now fell from his nose and mouth. Your payment is due, my grandfather said in a voice that was totally unlike his own. It had a gurgling quality. More blood frothed and dripped down his chin as he spoke. Do you think I am a fool who forgets so easily? Your family owes me a debt, and I will take my payment now. He stopped forward, stomping on my left arm with a manic strength that far surpassed his weight. I heard my elbow crack, a burning agony shooting up through my body as I tried to crawl away. At that moment, I heard a knock at the door. The hospice nurse peeked her head in, a look of concern and confusion crossing her face as she saw the scene in front of her. She threw the screen door open and ran in. Mr. Middleton! She cried out to my grandfather. What is the meaning of this? He looked at her, 
his mouth opening in a scream of fury as he ran at her, dripping a trail of blood behind him. I tried to crawl away towards the bathroom, where I would lock myself in, but I looked back. The nurse had fumbled with her keychain, pulling out a canister of mace and spraying it in his face. Her lips pursed in a scolding expression that made her look much older than she actually was. I wanted to laugh at the look on her face, but the fury and pain roaring through my arm brought me back to the gravity of the situation. Stop this madness! The nurse cried at him, soaking his face until the canister started to sputter and run out. My grandfather started clawing at his eyes and face, shrieking and running in circles, totally blind now. The nurse ran over to me, putting her hand out and pulling me up by my good arm. Every time my smashed arm bumped the ground or a chair or the side of a door, it sent a shock like electricity running through my body. I squinted my eyes, trying to keep tears of agony, loss, and horror from pouring forth. The being who had taken possession of my grandfather had stopped clawing at his face. Dark red gouges ran from his forehead down to his chin now. It was a terrible, gory sight. His eyes streamed water and blood as he tried to blink quickly, speaking and chanting quickly in some language I had never heard before. A dark cloud seemed to pass overhead. The quicker he spoke, the darker it got outside. By the time the nurse had dragged me out of the front door by my good hand, the sky was totally black. I glanced up and saw I was not in my front yard at all, and that what I was seeing wasn't the sky. We were in the middle of some kind of cave, with torches lining the wall. It was as if the house had been loaded onto some massive tractor trailer and dropped off in a totally random place, in the middle of a massive passage with stalactites and stalagmites crowding the chamber. The cave split off in front of us. One trail appeared to go up, the next went straight, and the third appeared to go deeper down into the cave. I had no time to try to listen for breezes or feel for fresh air coming out of any of the tunnels. I started running on the trail leading upwards, and the nurse was right behind me. Torches continued to illuminate the way, flickering and casting off eerie shadows in the cave. I heard the door to the house slam open behind us. It echoed off the walls of the cave like a gunshot, making me jump. My skin crawled as whatever had taken over my grandfather began to wail, a sound halfway between a screaming woman and the shrieking jets of an airplane taking off. It was inhuman and impossibly loud, and I knew it was angry. It was running after us, its naked feet slamming against the stone floors. I couldn't run as fast with my arm on fire from the horrific break it had suffered and the nurse wasn't very athletic either. I could tell she probably hadn't had the run like this in years, maybe even decades. She was extremely red and out of breath, huffing and puffing, and I doubted I looked much better, trying not to swing or move my damaged arm at all, and likely white as a sheet from the pain and adrenaline. But I was slightly faster than her still. With horror, I heard that thing grab her by the shoulder, flipping her around. She had been in my peripheral vision, and now she was gone behind us. I ran as fast as I could. Her trembling screams followed me down the tunnel. I turned one last time before I was too far away, and what I saw will continue to haunt me in my worst nightmares. Whatever had taken over my grandfather was biting all over her, drinking her blood. Her throat was mostly bitten open, bright red arterial spurts of blood pouring down the front of her body. The creature, in its frenzy, had bitten her over and over again, on the throat, on the face, on the stomach, and now licked and sucked the blood from every womb, moaning and sighing in pleasure. Pieces of my grandfather's body had begun to fall off. While sprinting after us, the skin and flesh of his feet slamming against the stone had worn off some, and now bloody footprints followed them from behind. But there was something underneath my grandfather's body, 
wearing it like a child might wear a Halloween costume. I could see it poking out. It was twisted and pale, looking like braided bones covered in a thin, pale layer of skin. It looked back up at me one last time, and I saw my grandfather's face had begun to disintegrate too. Underneath it, I saw the face of what might have been a mutated old man, his skin mottled in blue, his eyes pure black, his nose looking like a crooked hawk's beak. He smiled, showing off teeth that were far too long and sharp looking for a man. Then he turned back to his meal, and continued biting the screaming dying woman and sucking her blood. More pieces of my grandfather fell off in the struggle. Soon, I knew there would be nothing left but the creature underneath. The Ferryman. I put distance between us. The echoes of the ferryman and the nurse followed me very far, bouncing off the walls and almost seeming to amplify with distance rather than fade. The tunnel got very thin at some points, so I had to turn my body to slip through. But eventually, I heard the soft gurgling of a stream up ahead, and that brought me great relief. I ran out of the tunnel into a huge chamber. The river I had heard stood about 40 feet off, giving the chamber a pleasant misty smell, though it mixed with something foul and rotten in the air. Mummified animals and people were lined up on the ground to my right, and to my left, a pile of dead bodies lay, at least five feet high in its center. It was disgusting to look at, blood and fluids dripping off the fingers and faces of the corpses bloating skin ready to pop like an overstuffed balloon, milky eyes with squirming worms writhing inside. I heard the ferryman who had taken my grandfather's body. He wasn't far behind me now. I had no choice at this point. I could try to swim across the river, but my grandfather had told me there was horrible things under its surface. Hands that would drag you underneath and never let you up. I could take his boat, which was laying on the soft dirt not ten feet away, but it had a thick rope on it to pull it back. And so, I ran towards the pile of dead bodies. I tried to move one aside, but rancid gases blew off the corpse's mouth, sending droplets of clotted blood and its putrefying stench right into my face. I almost vomited right there. But the ferryman was walking through the door, I could hear his footsteps by this point. I lay down and draped a body over me. I kept my eyes pointed towards the middle path in the center of the chamber, watching the ferryman. He had ripped off the rest of my grandfather's flesh, though patches of the blood and gore still clung onto his skin here and there. He was naked, hunched over, grunting and breathing hard. Unhealthy blue and purple splotches arose from his skin as he walked. He turned to the mummies, and with a few words, woke them up. There were all sorts of animals laying there, from dogs to coyotes to bears, skunks, possums, cats, and much else. There were also humans and half-human half-animals, who reminded me of ancient Egyptian gods or hieroglyphics. Some had human bodies with large hawk heads or alligator faces. With creaking bones, they all began to move together. They pushed themselves up in unison, the tight white wrappings bent with their joints. In the eyes of all of them, however, I saw nothing. There was no glimmer of intelligence or cautiousness. It was as if they were puppets being held up by invisible strings. Go find him, the ferryman said in a low, powerful tone. I could see him standing not far away, fully transformed into his normal body now. In the name of Heron, find him! There were five tunnels branching off of this main one. I had come out of the one on the far left. I had no idea where the other four led, though I saw they all led downwards and all seemed to have endless torches lighting their halls. The creatures split naturally into groups, as if they were just water going downhill. There was no discussion, no looking around, 
just some sort of undead hive mind that told them instinctually what to do. After a while, I heard the ferryman wander away as well. Once I was sure I was alone, I started to move the dead bodies on top of me and around me. I was gagging and retching, trying to be as quiet as possible. But the smell was so strong I could quite literally taste it. The smell of rotting bodies is horrible, like a combination of putrefying roadkill with rotting fruit and feces mixed in. It was all over my clothing and skin now, too, and some of the clotted blood from the bodies had smeared across my face. I wanted to get out of there. As fast as I could, I slinked over to the boat. It was heavily decorated with arcane symbols, and in the boat, I saw paddles and a long stick. With my good arm, I dragged the boat over to the shore and pushed it into the water, jumping in as it started floating. It was lighter than it looked, for which I was thankful. If it was much heavier, I would have needed both arms to move it, and that just wasn't happening. Using the long stick, I pushed myself off of the shallow part of the riverbank and started paddling rapidly with one hand. The river was significantly bigger than it looked like in the darkness. Once I was about one-fourth the way across, I began to flag, needing to rest my sore arm. My broken arm was swollen up significantly, but the pain had gone down. It was more like a constant dull throbbing that seemed to move in time with my heartbeat. I just kept telling myself that it was almost over, I was almost done, and then I'd be at a hospital with opioids and real doctors and clean gauze, instead of here in this cursed river next to a pile of decomposing corpses. Sign, I grabbed the paddle again and started forward. The light here was fairly dim, since the torches were all gathered on the stone walls of each shore. I couldn't see much more than silhouettes. If I waved my hand in front of my eyes, all that appeared was a dim shadow. In the same way, however, I could see something moving in the water. It was too dark to tell exactly what, but something was alive down there. Of that, I was sure. I kept paddling, pushing my body to its limits. I could see the farther shore now. The light from the torches shone more brightly as I approached, and I could see more silhouettes underneath the water. There were bodies down there. Some of them had bleached white skin and swollen, waterlogged arms and hands that constantly waved at the boat. Others had black, shiny skin with reptilian eyes and huge, fishy mouths that opened and closed underwater, grinning wide the entire time. I stopped looking at the surface of the water, keeping my eyes fixed on the approaching shore, the path to freedom. And then I heard the sound that chilled my bone and nearly caused me to drop the paddle. The shrieking of the ferryman, who had returned to his chamber. Looking back, I saw him standing on the shore, and just to his left, surrounded by a semi-circle of mummified corpses who protected him as if they were members of some Praetorian guard. They started pulling on the rope, pulling me back to certain death. I calculated my distances. I was about ten feet from the farther shore now. In reality, I had no choice. My only chance was ahead. I jumped into the water. At first, I went under and came up. Nothing grabbed me or impeded me in any way. I was glad and I started swimming forward as fast as I could. And that was when I felt them. Cold, slimy hands began to run across my pants, grabbing at my shoes, going underneath my shirt. Soon they were touching my face and trying to pull me under. I felt them all around me, but I was so close. I looked ahead. I was only a few feet away. A surge of adrenaline filled my body. I let them pull me under slightly, then opened my eyes underwater. I saw three of them grabbing me, and I kicked them in the faces one by one as hard as I could. I still had my left shoe on, 
and when it connected with a swollen purple nose on a waterlogged corpse, the corpse shrieked underwater in anger and pain, blowing bubbles from its rotting body as it did so. Before I knew it, I was free, gasping and sputtering on the far shore. I rolled on my back, coughing out some water. The boat was still being dragged back by the rope, and I knew I didn't have unlimited time. After a few more seconds of rest, I got up unsteadily and began to run. I ran out of the cave and into the woods, and it was just like my grandfather said. Some of the trees on this cursed trail were marked with an eye surrounded by a clawed hand. I made it back to town, the place my grandfather had grown up. I was over 200 miles away from my house, the place where I had started this bizarre journey. I called a cousin who lived about an hour away from where I was, got fixed up at the hospital, and eventually went home later that day. Agents in black suits showed up that week and took samples from the house after I told investigators from the state police some of what happened, but those strange unidentified agents never asked me any questions. Needless to say, we didn't end up burying my grandfather's remains, and that was all my fault. Now, whenever anyone in my family dies, I will be there, ready to put two pure silver coins over their eyes for passage to the other side. For I never want to see the ferryman again, even though I know one day I will, and hopefully, I will have silver coins for my passage across the river. <laughs>